Welcome to Fundamentals of Faith from Love Walk Christian Center. This is our prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We want his kingdom here in earth as it is in heaven, and we're not waiting for it someday. We're expecting it now. There's no reason to pray for something that's going to happen after you're dead. I mean, you... it it. It's okay to pray for good things after you're dead because you want things to be good for your children's children, right? But, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about, you know, they want to know how to pray. They're not asking how to pray for tomorrow. They're asking how to pray for, like, we watch, we're watching you pray, and we're watching the results of your prayers. And because we're watching you pray and we're seeing the results of your prayers, can you please teach us how to pray so that we can get the same results? Amen? Amen. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we'll start at verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He called them together and he gave them power to, right? He he called them together and he gave them power against unclean spirits and to, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, right? He did this before he died, which meant that this was available under the old covenant. And if this was available under the old covenant, how much greater, right? Because that's why Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do in greater, because these works were available under the old covenant. The works to... to, have power against unclean spirits and cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and disease was available under the old covenant. That's why the prophet was angry when when Naaman came to him and he said, well, I went to your king and he couldn't do anything for me because the anointing that was upon the king was available. The anointing that was on the king under the old covenant was available to be against unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all manner of sickness and disease. It was available. And you know it was because in Jesus preaching, again, he made them angry. He said, how come only the leper from another country got healed? And how come only the widow from another country got blessed? How come they got blessed when the covenant was available to your widows and the covenant was available to your lepers? Why did another leper come and he get healed? Why did another why did a widow from another country get blessed by the prophet being in her house? Because there wasn't a widow in Israel who would take the prophet into the house. Okay? But the covenant that they had, this power was available under the old covenant, which is why then later Jesus says, "Oh, but the works that I that I've done, you haven't seen anything yet." Because the works I've done, you'll do them in greater because there's soon going to be a greater covenant. There's soon going to, right? There's soon going to be a greater covenant. So here, he's released his disciples under the old covenant to go out and do what was already available to them under the old covenant. Knowing that after his death and resurrection, he would endue them with power at a greater degree because now he could release the fullness of the kingdom to them under the new covenant instead of the old. Amen? But under this old covenant, this is awesome. Under this old covenant, verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, They're still under the old covenant. They're only going to go preach to their people, right? But we know that at the end of the book, right? Let's see. What does it say here? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So he, he took them from chapter 10. Okay, you have power under this covenant to bring healing to the nation of Israel, right? But in chapter 28, he's like, okay, now... You're going to have power. Wait, he told them, go and wait in Jerusalem. I'm going to send you power. But know that the direction that I'm giving you is you're now to go to all nations. He didn't put a limit on it anymore. He didn't say just Jerusalem. He didn't say just your people because now we're under a new covenant. We're stepping out into a new season, right? And guess what? We're in that season. It's not just for the house of Israel. It's for all of us. And he didn't just give it to 12 disciples. He gave it to all his disciples. John chapter 17 says, and all who would believe according to your word. Anybody who would believe you after me, I'm praying for them. Anybody who, who will come after you and believe on me, they're now going to have access to what I'm giving you and what I'm praying over you. Amen? So he's teaching his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then he's showing them what it looks like, right? Because they wanted to learn how to pray so that they'd get the same results he, he was getting. And so just a couple chapters later, after he's done doing a whole bunch of preaching, he says, okay, I've taught you how to pray so you can get the results I'm getting. Now let's get them. Now let's get them. And he gave them power to go do what he was doing, knowing that now they know how to pray, so they're going to get my results because not just because I gave them power, the power is already there in the covenant. I've just told them they have it. The problem is a lot of Christians don't know that they have it. They think only the pastor has it. Only the evangelist has it. Only the missionary has it. Only the apostle has it. They, they think that only certain ones have the power and that it's okay for them to just sit in the seats every Sunday and let somebody else do it. But he called us all disciples. He, he sent these 12 out, but then, then let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter, well, let's first go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. This is the same, same setting here. He called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases and sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, Okay. And then in chapter 10, it says, after these things, verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. That's where most Christians stop. Oh, that, I don't know if I can do that, you know, because the lambs are going to get out there and I'm just going to be slaughtered out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a martyr for Jesus because, I, I, you know, he sent me out there and I'm just going to get wrecked out there. And so you, you hidey hole in your house because you don't want to be a lamb to the slaughter. Well, guess what? Jesus was the lamb to the slaughter, not you. You're more than conquerors. You need to know who you are. I've been talking about it for the last uh, week, and uh, there's been a couple of Bible studies and meetings, and I've continued to talk about it, but not all of you got to hear about it. But uh, we have an authority. We have a, a power. We have we have the light of the Lord Jesus Christ working on the inside of us. Holy Spirit on the inside of us is attractive to the world. Christians have this victim mentality. The world's out there to get me. 
Satan's going to get me. Another level, another, another devil. I, you know, if I do something for God, I'm going to get beat up. If, if I move on and, and I serve Jesus, you know, he's going to come and get my family. And I'm going to have lots of trouble because the devil's after me. Because I'm, and, and we even go like this. Oh, well, you know, if the devil's after me, that must mean I'm doing something right. And we have this victim mentality that because we're living for Jesus, the devil can just come and beat us up. Who said that? That's not in the word. In fact, yes, the Bible said that you'll be persecuted. But when the persecution comes, this, it, it's, uh, it's a process that comes later. Okay, let, let, me, let me help you understand what I'm saying. The world is attracted to Christ truly attracted because he draws all men unto him. Where the persecution comes is that when all men become, begin to come unto the light that's in you, those in power get concerned that they're going to lose their influence over others. And when they begin to lose their influence, persecution comes. So for, let, me, let me give you an example. As Christians, we make an impact on the city. And according to Acts, thousands come into the kingdom. That's what's supposed to be happening, right? They were added daily to the church. And so the people that had the money and the influence and the power start getting worried. We're losing money because nobody's buying this stuff. We're losing money because the people aren't doing, you know, the normal crazy things that they normally were doing. And we're losing power because, you know, these poor people, they're, they're, they're learning they don't have to be poor anymore. And so now we're not, we don't have the government control over them anymore. And so what would happen then is that the leaders, the government officials, the, the high merchants and businessmen would get concerned. And that's where the persecution came. It didn't come from your neighbor. It didn't come from the person that you're ministering to. The persecution came from those in authority who were worried about losing their influence because the crowds were coming to Jesus. They turned the city upside down. See, we have to know where the persecution's coming from. Je yes, Jesus warned there'd be persecution, but he didn't say that every Tom, Dick, and Harry would be beating you up. He didn't say that everywhere you go, you're going to get persecuted. No, because those people are drawn and attracted to Christ. They're attracted to the idea that I can be free? You mean that I've been persecuted and tormented by this for, for 45 years and now I can be free of it? You mean I don't have to have these nightmares every time I go to bed? You mean I don't have to be influenced by this craziness that makes me want to kill myself every day? You have to understand that the world absolutely desperately wants the Jesus in you. They, don't, they might not say that because they don't know it until they see it. But persecution? Persecution is going to come from government. Persecution is going to come from... The leaders of the city, guess where else persecution is going to come from? From the leaders of churches that aren't in agreement with the Christ you're giving? Oh, that church over there, they're messing up my people. My people are getting healed and delivered, and now they don't need me anymore. They're, they're, they're running out on my church because I've been giving them watered-down milk and teaching them that, you know, God's, you know, going to get them if they mess up, and this pastor over here is delivering them, and now they don't need me anymore. That's where persecution comes. It comes from religious leaders. It comes from government. It comes from people in authority that don't like that you are taking the influence that they have over people. Do you get it? Amen. So here in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, let's, let's read that again. Therefore, he said unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. 
Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. He, he's not talking about how much money you have or don't have when you go out. He's talking about expect to be fully provided for by me. Expect to get everything that you need from me, physically, spiritually. You're not going after people to get something from them. You're going after people to give something to them. Okay? So, because there's a lot of people out there that think, well, you know, I'm going to go after the crowds and they're going to give me stuff. Well, you may get some stuff, but that's not what you're going for. And if that's what you're going for, you should stay home. Let's read um, chapter, or sorry, not chapter. Let's read verse 9. And heal the sick that are in, that are in the city that you come into, and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. It's important, absolutely important, that we get a hold of the fact that we bring the kingdom with us. It, 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 it's absolutely vital that you understand. So a lot of people want to go out and preach because they think, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm a Christian. I got to go preach. I got to go, I got to go preach. I got to go lay hands on the sick. And they're in such a hurry to do that. See, what we're talking about, we got to get back to the beginning. We're talking about the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray because we see you pray. We see you go out into the desert in the early morning and spend hours with your father. Then we see you go out into the desert in the night and spend hours with your father. I'm sitting here going, did he sleep? I'm seeing, because they're seeing him go out and commune with his father all the time. And then when he's with them, the kingdom shows up. So they're like, God, you know, Jesus Teach us to pray like you pray, because you pray, and then look what happens. And so, because he's asking, because, or excuse me, because they're asking, how do we pray? And he's telling them, this is how you pray. The, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. These are the results that you're going to get. And so, when you go out there, people's lives are going to be changed. When you show up, the kingdom is at hand. And the problem is, is that most of us don't know that. We're not convinced on it. The reason Jesus was convinced the kingdom would show up everywhere he went is because he spent time with the Father. And then he's teaching his disciples, if you'll spend time with my father, then you'll know that when you show up, the kingdom shows up. The problem with a lot of Christians is that they want to show up and try to preach and heal and set free, only they didn't spend any time with the father. So like the sons of Sceva, when they show up to take authority over the devils, the devils beat them up. And so Christians then are, they're doing spiritual warfare and they're praying and they're shouting and they're screaming and then they go home and they're being beat up by the devil and, and, and sometimes even taking on the demons that they just delivered somebody from because they haven't spent time with the Father expecting what he is showing them to take place when they go out. They just think they got to do it. And yes, we have to take some action, but we don't take any action without the Father. How do you think that it's okay for you to take action without the Father when Jesus didn't? Jesus didn't take any action without the Father, and yet Christians do it every day. They take action all the time without the Father, and then they wonder why is that... Well, they wonder why we have these skewed ideas like I was talking about. Like, oh, you know, the ne next level, another devil, and we're, we're expecting these attacks, and we're expecting to, we're constantly expecting to be defeated, and then we got to win another battle. You should never be expected to, expecting to be defeated. You should only ever be expecting to win every time, every time. Uh, in fact... 
You, the devil's your enemy. Enemies attack. But see, the Bible says that we have weapons of warfare, right? You have a shield of faith that quenches fiery darts. See, Christians are thinking, oh, I'm under attack, I'm under attack, I'm being, I'm being pressed, I'm being, I'm being defeated, I'm, I'm getting hurt, it's violent, I'm getting wounded, and, and we think that's part of our Christian walk. But your shield of faith is so supposed to quench the dart before the dart hits you. We're letting darts hit us and then asking God to heal the wounds. That's not what the word says. We're not supposed to be letting the devil just hear, you know, target practice, you know, I'm walking in love, I'm walking in love, hit me, hit me, hit me. Oh, Jesus, heal it, it hurts. He quenches the fiery darts. Quenches it. Quenches means that the fire is coming at you, and before it can hit you, it's quenched. Quenched means the fire's put out. There's no dart left, and if it hits anything, it hits your shield, so it doesn't do any damage. Yeah, quench. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to turn to um, the book of Joel. I shared a little bit of what I'm going to talk about, but kind of from a different direction um, at the Bible study that I had on Monday. Um, but I'm going to share some different things today. The Lord spoke to me. Um, last week. And he said this to me. The enemy is waging an all-out offensive attack against the body of Christ. And not just against the body of Christ, he's waging an all-out offensive attack against the world. He hates them. He, they're not his... Oh, what's, what's the word? They're not his allies. The world that's not serving Jesus are not the allies of the devil. He hates them as much as he hates you. Because they're mankind, and he hates man. He hates mankind because God loves him. God loves every single person out there, no matter what trash and garbage they're involved in. He loves them. He's passionate about changing their life and rescuing them and delivering them. He loves them. His heart is for them. Jesus looked out upon the crowds with compassion. And he said, oh, Father, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're wounded and broken, and my heart just wants to heal them, protect them, draw them in, and shelter them. That's how God looks at mankind, and Satan hates them. So he is just as actively out to destroy them as he is out to destroy you. And, and if we could see that, it, it might change how you view them. So uh, the Lord told me that the enemy is waging an all-out offensive attack against the body of Christ, and he's picking people off one by one. And Christians have been waging a war of defense. And I shared a little bit about this in the, the Bible study. I'm going to take a minute just to give you the image. I'm not a big sports person, but I did play basketball, and I understand a little bit of football. Um, you have an offensive team, and you have a defensive team. Of course, in basketball, the same team plays both. But when they're on one side of the court, they're in one role. And when they're on the other side of the court, they're in the other role. They're always one or the other, right? And so what happens, the defensive team is trying to protect their territory. I, I just got to keep you from hit, getting a basket, or I got to keep you from scoring a touchdown, right? 
They're on defense. They're protecting their territory, constantly in protection mode. But the offense is taking it in. They, they are determined to make a, a, a score, to, to get the, the win, okay? And so what the, what the Lord is speaking here is that Satan's on the offensive, he is pressing in to, to, take the, to get the score, to take the victory. He's pressing in for the win. And Christians are just busy trying to protect the goal. I picture a soccer goalie just trying to, we're, we're not going out to get the win. We're just trying to keep the enemy from scoring. That's not the way that God wants us to be fighting this war. We shouldn't just be protecting our territory. We're supposed to be taking territory, okay? And the way that we take territory starts in prayer. From there, it's following the leading of Holy Spirit and what he wants us to do. It doesn't look like programs. It doesn't look like anything that anybody's ever done. It looks like what Holy Spirit says, it, it looks like what Jesus did. He just went. He went where God said when he said it. So in our society, that doesn't necessarily mean standing on a street corner. It means when I go. Wherever I go, I need to be hearing Holy Spirit. And I don't need to get kooky and weird about it. I, I need to just do what he says. And I can't truly do what he says if I'm not truly seeking him. So a lot of times Christians are seeking the, the see me part. If I pray for somebody, I'll be seen. I'll, I'll have a testimony. I'll have something to talk about. People will hear my voice and something will happen. And they, they want the, the prestige of doing something. We have to check our hearts and our motivations, right? You know, Jesus was gracious. He said, that the disciples came to him one day and they said, hey, these people over here, they're casting out demons in your name. And he said, don't worry about that. If they're not against me, they're for me. But he didn't tell them to do things the way that those people were doing it. He said, you follow me. You be led by me. You do as your master does. Don't, you don't worry about what they're all doing. If they're not against me, they're for me. Okay? But you let me be concerned about them, right? He said, if it wasn't planted by my father, it'll get rooted up and you don't need to worry about it. Right? So, if we stay in defense mode, a fortress that's under siege eventually falls. I know we don't totally understand that concept today, but it, if, if you take back the old days, a castle under siege always falls. Why? Because it runs out of supply. Sooner or later, the people starve. So one way or the other, the ones that are inside are losing. The ones that are only protecting their territory are going to lose. We're not on the losing team, which means that we have to change our tactics. In Joel chapter 1, I want to start at verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. I want, I want, I want the people in the room, and, and specifically at this moment, it's talking to, let, let's just say we're talking to those over 60, just for a moment, okay? Okay, because it's specifically said, and I, I'm not calling you old, please don't get offended, but I, I, here, here's, here's what it's saying. You've been here a little longer. You've been here on the planet a little longer. You've seen some things. You've seen this, this world in a different condition than what you see it today, right? Okay, I, I'm, I'm 47. Am I 40? Yeah. <laughs> I'm 47, yeah, I think so. Oh, there we go. Uh, 
I had a moment there. Um, I'm 47, and the world looks a whole lot different today than it looked when I was a child. Okay? So I want you to hear this in this perspective, those of you that are older. I, I'm, not, not, I'm not, not speaking to those that are younger. We'll get there in a second. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten. And that which the locust has left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. I, I want you to think about where, where we're at as a nation, as a world at the moment. Can you see this? I'm talking... <laughs> Morally, financially, economically, as a, as a world system. I'm talking about the family. I'm, uh, I'm talking about uh, the church as a, as a whole. That which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. It's things have deteriorated and they are diminishing and they're diminishing at a very rapid pace. And then there's verse 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now, I want to take a moment. I want you to understand the new wine is always Holy Spirit. And so I believe that what... The prophet is speaking here is he's speaking to a generation that appears to be drinking the wine of the spirit but is not now I want us to think we we have a we have a generation that has been building up and and we have this season here over the last number of years where Worship has become a primary force in Christianity. It's a beautiful thing, and yet most of it's not doing a whole lot for the kingdom. I'm not saying nobody is. Please, please hear my heart. I'm not saying nobody is. But I think people have become fascinated with the movement rather than with the mover. They've been, they, they've become fascinated with the concept of worship and the idea of worship. And we're even seeing celebrities get involved in this movement of worship because it's such a big thing and it's capturing so much attention. But is the spirit of Christ showing up on the scene to heal, to set free, to deliver, to change lives? In some places, yes, but in most places, no. A, a, a great worship team doesn't mean that the anointing of God is present. A great move of the anointing doesn't come just because there's great worshipers. It comes because the heart is where it's supposed to be. It, it comes because the heart and passion is, I just want you to experience Christ. I don't want to be seen. I don't care about whether I'm heard. It doesn't matter whether I'm famous. I want the anointing of the Holy Spirit to show up on the scene because I'm here, the kingdom's here, because I'm here whether it's a worshiper, whether it's a preacher, whether it's you just ministering to an individual and, and loving on them because the kingdom is in you, the kingdom should be being revealed through you. Righteousness should be being revealed. If we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, then righteousness is revealed. What happens when righteousness is revealed is that lives are changed. Not Oh, I gave my life to Jesus, but I still do everything that I've always done, and I still live the way I've always lived, and I still do all the stuff I've always done, because listen, 
when Jesus shows up, change happens. Visible, lasting change. Nobody has to make it happen. It doesn't, listen, I'm sorry, it doesn't even have to be discipled into you. When Holy Spirit truly shows up on this scene and somebody is completely impacted by Jesus, their life changes. Their heart changes. Their direction changes. They are hungry and passionate for something different than they ever have been before. And, and so what I want you to see here is that the church, this, the prophet is saying, wake up. You've been drinking wine, but it's not, it's, it's counterfeit. It looks like the anointing. It looks like the move of the Holy Spirit. People are shaking and moving and, and it's praying in tongues and they're falling out in the spirit and it looks spiritual. But it's counterfeit because I'm not there. Wake up. Wake up, you drunkards, weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. The enemy hates the world. He's waging an all-out offensive attack against the body of Christ, picking them off one by one. He has laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree. He's made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches of it are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests of the Lord's minister, the priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourns. The corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up, and the oil languishes. The oil is also representative of Holy Spirit. He is so hungry to move in the body of Christ. Um, because we're satisfied with surface, a surface touch, we don't want to go deeper. We just want to feel a little bit. And, and, and get our, our emotions assaged. But, it, but because of that, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen. He's speaking to the preachers now. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. And remember, Jesus said the field is white with a harvest, but the laborers are few. If you don't go get a harvest, it dies on the vine. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Remember that pastor has frequently talked about, and it's in the word over and over again, that the trees are the people of God. Trees of righteousness, he calls us. But how many visions have we seen, and even in the, in the word, where the trees are dying? And the instruction to the, to the prophet is, tend my trees, water my trees, bring back to life my trees. Because why? Because the leaves are for the healing of the nations, that's, that's you. You're, you're for the healing of the nations. But if you're dried up and, and the oil isn't functioning and, and uh, you, you're drunk on, on counterfeit wine instead of the true wine of the Holy Spirit and, and the kingdom's not showing up but it just feels good, which is what is happening in a vast majority of the body of Christ today, then the harvest is dying on the vine. That means the people that are desperately hungry for Jesus and they don't even know it are dying on the vine. Guess what? They're going to hell and you're sitting there happy that you're drunk on some counterfeit wine. Uh, listen, I'm not beating us up. I'm not beating us up. We're talking about how do we change this? It starts in prayer. 
Oh, yeah, I've heard Christians over the years, oh, you know, I'm tired of praying. We got to get out there and do something. Well, the problem is that the Christians decided they didn't need to pray. They just needed to get out there and do something. And so we decided that prayer wasn't enough. If we would get in prayer and find the wisdom of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'm, I don't want to be satisfied with counterfeit wine. I don't want Holy Spirit to, to languish because we won't let him do what he wants to do. And I don't want his harvest to die because we're selfish and would rather just drink some wine for ourselves instead of share what we have. The vines dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree and the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withheld from the house of your God. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. We're talking about getting in prayer. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty God, it shall come. Now, I, I want to, not that this other stuff isn't important, but I want to skip down to um, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Blow the trumpet. He says, wake up, drunkard. Stop being, stop being drunk on this, on this, you know, just in, I'm just enjoying the spirit. Stop being drunk on that. I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy the spirit. But he's saying over and over through the prophetic words of the Old Testament and the New Testament, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, sound an alarm, blow a trumpet, get your attention, I need you up. Because then Joel continues to talk about that his great army, guess what? His great, like, like you read that chapter and if you read it without, without revelation, it's like, oh, there's a, you know, there's trouble and terror coming on the earth and it's going to destroy everything in its path. No, he's talking about you and I. He's talking about the church rising up to flood over the land and take over everything in its path, to take over territory after territory after territory, to not be satisfied, to burn up everything that's not like Christ, to cause everything. Because what? Oh, but persecution might come. Oh, yes, it will, but not from them. Because as you come over their path, they're going to change. The persecution's going to come from those going, oh, my gosh, we just lost this, these people. Oh my gosh, we just lost this funding. Oh my gosh, they're not, they're not funding our projects anymore. Where'd that go? They're putting it over here. Why? Because the world got turned upside down. They, we're talking about, listen, listen to this verse. It says, uh, let's, verse 7. Uh, actually, uh, no, let's, let's, let's start at verse 3. A fire devours, devours before them. That's you. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. Why? Because Holy Spirit's going with you. He's, he's your rear guard. He's in front of you and behind you. A fire burns before them, and behind them a flame burns. And the land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yes, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as of horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap. I'm talking about you. This is an offensive battle. Like the noise of chariots on the top of the mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, they shall run like mighty men. This is you. 
They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break ranks. Neither shall, listen to this part, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when, when they fall upon the sword, they'll not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. You're going in to the enemy's territory and taking not back what's yours. You're taking back everything, all of his house, all the, all the goods of his house. You're, you're going after the spoil. You, the enemy has been waging an offensive war while we sit here and go, oh, this is my church, don't touch it. This is my home, don't touch it. Oh my gosh, beat me up. Oh, look, Jesus, heal it. The, the, the devil attacked me. And we're playing this defensive game, but his word says we're supposed to be on the offensive. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? I don't have any more time, but I want you to see that we have a defensive war, or excuse me, an offensive war to wage. And we can't do it just thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go out and fight. No, you're going you're gonna to get in the presence and face of God, and you're going to do what he says. And when you do, you're going to get his results. Amen? Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the revelation of your word. And I thank you for true Revival fire, God. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to partner with us, please visit our website at lovewalkcc.org or you can reach us by mail at 13319 Wallaceville Road, Houston, Texas, 77049. Remember, continue to walk in the extravagant love of Christ.